Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Sabbath afternoon Torah study and prayer service. Hope you're all well and blessed to the Most High. Uh, my name's Ovadia, and I'm with Sabbath Keepers Fellowship. But before we do anything else, let's have a prayer. Father Yahweh, we come before your throne on this year, Yom HaShabbat, your Sabbath day. We thank you so much for all your blessings, for enabling us to, to be here, to reach this season, to be here this day. We thank you for waking us with breath in our lungs. And despite our difficulties, trials, and problems, you always bring us through and you're faithful. We know you do all for us, uh, to our own help, and so that your kingdom is brought to us, brought to pass. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. There are so many, Father. Try as we might. We break your commandments and we sin. Thank you for your grace and mercy that we don't have to depend, have to depend on our law keeping to find favor with you. But through the blood of Yehoshua, Mashiach, we're saved. And that said, because we know you love when we walk in your commandments, when we keep your law and walk in the way, Help us to understand these commands. Show us that way, even more clear. Fill our minds with wonderful things from your Torah, and then let us do them. We want to please you, Father. Help us do that. Today and every day, in Yahushua's name, amen. Now for the day's lesson. Baruch atah Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam. Blessed art thou, Yahweh, our Elohim, who gives us the Torah. Uh, the Torah portion for this week is Vayish Lach. Um, that title comes from the first significant word in the Torah portion, uh, as always. Uh, that's how they're named. Uh, and this one is from, this portion is Breshith, uh, in, uh, Genesis uh, 32.3 through 36.43. And the verse says, uh, and Yaakov sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, uh, in the field of Edom. Uh, that word, uh, and he sent, uh, or and sent Yaakov, uh, is Vayishlach. Uh, the V at the beginning is a Vav, and it means and. Uh, Yishlach. Shlach is to uh, to send something to someone. Uh, during the festival of Purim, uh, we send portions to the poor or our neighbors uh, of something excellent to eat or whatever. Uh, shalach. The shalachim are the sent ones, the apostles. Uh, that's what they were called in Hebrew, or are called in Hebrew. And so by uh, the, the yish is, uh, can either mean he or shall, or he shall, depending on the context. So by Yishlach, and he sent Yaakov. Uh, the Torah portion, the parasha, is generally about uh, the journey of Yaakov to Yisrael from uh, his brother Levan, uh, his wrestling with the Moloch, the angel, uh, on the mount, uh, his encounter with Esau's brother uh, and his fear about that, and then his settling in the land near Shechem. Uh, it also includes the assault of on Dinah, Yaakov's daughter, uh, in their uh, in their encounter with the Hivi or the uh, Hivites, I guess uh, most people call them. <clears throat> uh, after, subsequent to that assault on. On Dina. That's pretty much what the Torah portion is about. Uh, the Torah, the, I'm sorry, the, the, there is, one more time, there is one counted commandment found again uh, this week in the parasha, according to the Rambam, Moshe bin Maimon, uh, Maimonides, uh, whatever you uh, choose to call him, and according to most scholars. So let's get into that. The commandment 
according to rabbinical Judaism, is not to eat the sinew of the thigh, that is, in any, uh, any animal, and especially a sacrificed animal. <clears throat> it's based on the scripture in Bereshith, Genesis 32, 32, which says, that is why the children of Yisrael to this day do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of the thigh of Yaakov in the sinew of the hip. Uh, highly interpretive. Uh, in my opinion, that is not a commandment. The Most High is not giving that from his mouth. It doesn't say, thus saith Yahweh. It doesn't say, uh, you are commanded. It says that's the reason uh, almost as uh, a parenthetical uh, uh, statement. That's the reason that the people of Israel don't eat the sinew of the hip of any animal to this day. Now, again, that's my opinion. I could very well be wrong. But since it's not given by the mouth of the Most High, and... <clears throat> Since it doesn't say you shall, thou shalt, or anything of the sort, uh, I say it's not a commandment of the Most High. However, even if it's not, uh, does that mean we should still eat it or should we not? That's another question. Uh, we personally here do our best to eat in such a manner that we do not consume uh, the sinew of the hip. Um, it's hard to know what's ground into some meats. Uh, even according to kosher reckoning nowadays, sometimes that one uh, seems to get overlooked a bit or uh, not taken as seriously as it should. Unless you know the person you're getting your meat from, it's hard to uh, it's hard to make sure of that. So do we fail in that? Uh, very possibly so. Uh, is it easy to do? No. Uh, is there a solution for that? Yeah, don't eat meat. Uh, but in some places, the, the Torah commands us to eat meat. In any case, all those arguments and excuses aside, uh, the question is, should we do so? Um, I say no. We shouldn't do so not if we count ourselves among the people of Israel. Regardless of whether it's a commandment or not, uh, the Torah says clearly that the children of Israel don't do so, don't eat the sinew of the hip, because uh, even if it's as a tradition, a very ancient one, by the way, I would guess uh, 3,400 plus years, year old, uh, years old, uh, and the people of Israel have not been eating a sinew of the hip ever since Moshe's time. And so should we, if we're people of the people of Israel? And if you don't count yourself among the people of Israel, I'm sorry for you, first of all. Uh, they're the ones with whom the covenants are made and the promises. Uh, that is who Yehoshua said he came for, the lost sheep of Israel. Uh, to join, even Paul said, uh, if you're, Essentially, if you're not, well, not essentially, directly, he said, if you're not a member of the people, the commonwealth, the greater commonwealth of Israel, at the very least, uh, that you had, don't know Elohim and uh, don't, don't have salvation and Elohim's not in the world, you're not in his world. Or, um, he says you have no part in the kingdom, essentially, without Elohim and strangers to the promises, is what he said. Uh, so you, you want to be, you should, you should need to be a member of, at the very least, the greater commonwealth of Israel. And you do that by ingrafting, uh, by immersion and being brought into covenant with the Most High. And if your people don't do that, you probably shouldn't do it either. It's not a commandment, but... Uh, I and my family, we identify with the greater commonwealth 
the people of Yahweh, of Israel. And so we do our very best to abstain from eating the sinew of the hip in honor of that tradition or command, whichever you choose to call it. That's a lot to say about one commandment, but uh, it's counted among the 613 by Moshe ben Maimon. Uh, Uh, if it's not a commandment, that leaves only 612 according to them. Uh, so they has us uh, moving into the uncounted commandments for the parasha. In parashah uh, Vaishlach, uh, there is one uncounted command as well. And it's not the same one, obviously. Uh the command is that Yaakov should be fruitful and multiply in the land. It comes from Breshith, Genesis 35, 11, and 12. And it says, And Yahweh said to him, I am El Shaddai, be fruitful and increase. Uh, a nation and a company of nations shall be from you, and should kings come from your body. And the land which I gave Avraham and Yitzchak I give to you. And to your seed after you, I give this land. So, it's saying to be fruitful and multiply, uh, to have children, that Yaakov should do so. Uh, I would, even though it is definitely a commandment, it's not to us, it was to Yaakov specifically in his time. Could we interpret that spiritually somehow and, uh, and apply it to ourselves? Well, I don't see why not. Uh, Adam and Kava, uh, Adam and Eve, were originally given the command to be fruitful and multiply, and it applies to us, most especially as his people. By extension, I suppose, no, I think that you could also extend that to not only physical birth, but raising up disciples uh, for the kingdom, for Yeshua. Uh, for Yahweh to populate his his place, trying to, to evangelize and bring the truth to people, to tell the truth, show people the way. Um, all of the people who, it, it's, he said, go and make disciples. Um, a disciple, <laughs> contrary to uh, some popular belief, is not somebody that you smash on the forehead, say the sinner's prayer, and then leave, or spend an afternoon with and then don't see anymore. A disciple is somebody who chooses uh, to learn from you. Um, to be taught by you, and someone who stays to do that until they finish the learning. Uh, we're supposed to raise up disciples. People who do that <laughs> are not high and lofty or arrogant. Uh, most of them are very dedicated and committed. They give of themselves in their own time more than just a quick prayer. Uh, not just days, usually not just weeks, but months or years of their, of their lives in order to take the time to help somebody else learn to teach them the truth. And the disciple, the uh, Talmud, taught one, as uh, they were called uh, in Yehoshua's time, uh, are those who accept that person as a teacher, give them the honor and respect that they're due. I don't mean as a, a wonderful person or anything like that, but the honor and spe respect enough to let them teach them. And so to sit at their feet and learn from them until they've learned all they can. And sometimes even longer when the disciple joins and becomes a teacher himself. Hopefully, in every case, uh, they become equal to or greater than their teacher. Uh, but they stay with that person oftentimes even later on and afterwards when they have their own disciples. Uh, so... Discipling is something long-term, serious, something you plan and, and do, and you, uh, the, the teacher's desire and uh, actions are always for the benefit uh, of the disciple. That's the nature of true discipleship. 
and uh, we're commanded to do that. And so raising up disciples is like being multi uh, fruitful and multiplying. You could apply it spiritually in that way. I'm not saying this is, um, this is so. I don't make doctrine of it, but I believe that's, that's how it works and that there is a, a rightful and reasonable uh, analogy between those that uh, to be fruitful and multiply applies by extension even further than just to one's own children. Because what if you can't have children, don't have children? What if they, what if they turn from the way or won't embrace it? Does that mean you're done? I don't think so. So, anyway, um, this command is, uh, in its most literal form, was to uh, Yaakov, and uh, it was for him and his time, and shouldn't be counted among the active commands that we literally perform uh, every day, week, month, and year uh, ourselves. Uh, something else to be said about that commandment. Take note that uh, Yahweh says that now he, he was near the area of Shechem, uh, almost central, central uh, in the land of Israel. And he said, Yahweh said, and to your seed after you, I give this land. Um, we learned a, a while back when uh, uh, the Hitti uh, sold Avraham a plot of land for a burial site, the cave of Machpelah and uh, uh, the valley field uh, attached to it. That, that was a rightful deed. In this week's por uh, Torah portion, there's also uh, a sale of land and a price in Yisrael. And now... Uh, we have uh, Yahweh himself saying to this, your seed and after you I give this land. Uh, a covenant, most certainly, not necessarily a deed of sale. How much evidence do we need to prove the rightful ownership of the land of Israel? Um, I just thought that kind of stood out like a sore thumb in, the, in this verse, and I, I thought I'd bring it to your attention. Okay, uh, that, uh, that pretty much concludes the teaching on the commands for this week. One counted, one uncounted by uh, rabbinical scholars, uh, neither of them directly and literally applying to us. So what should we talk about? Um, I gave you some spiritual analogies. Uh, how about uh, the land or the area? I, I don't know how familiar you all are with uh, the geography of this most uh, recent or this, this week's Torah portion. And so I thought I'd uh, possibly help you with that. Uh, let's see what we can do. Okay, great. It works. <laughs> uh, Yaakov was running uh, from Levan way up here. And he was coming down this way along the Jordan River and past the Sea of Galilee. And then he took a turn and he came out and crossed the river Yavok, written here in Jabok. Uh, his brother, Esau, was living down here in and around Mount Seir and went up with 400 men to meet him in a confrontation here. And we all know the story, or at least I hope we do. Uh, Yaakov was afraid and he separated his family into groups. And um, that confrontation turned out to be uh, a reunion of sorts. Uh, at its end, Esau uh, went back to Mount Seir, but encouraged Yaakov to come with him down into this region, the region of Edom. Uh, Yaakov declined and uh, turned over this way 
He said he would come later, but he eventually settled for a time in the land of Shechem, where the encounter with uh, uh, Shechem and his uh, clan or his people occurred and the assault on Dinah. So that's a little bit about... uh, a little bit about the geography, and I hope it helps you see the picture of how these commands would, were given and where they were taking place. And uh, and what we're put a picture to what we're seeing. Okay, um, what else? Is there anything else? Of course, there is. Um, the subject of Dinah and. Um, The assault on her. It's a timely Torah portion. There are things going on in in Eretz Yisrael, the land of Yisrael today. Uh, Rape and slaughter is going on there. And I don't care what your politics are about it, although I hope... uh, I hope you are concerned with uh, blessing the people of Israel and uh, praying for them. Essentially, I hope you're on their side. It, it, It says that Yahweh will bless those who bless them, us, them. Uh, I see no difference. And curse those who curse them. You don't want to be caught cursing them, regardless of what you think or how you feel. In uh, in some, we're supposed to pray for the peace of Israel. Shalom, shalom, Israel. But right now they're in a trial, and their daughters have been raped, and their their baby slaughtered. The old people and kids burned. Uh, My point being, the sons of Yaakov uh, slaughtered the people of Shechem because of their assault on a daughter of Yisrael. Yaakov uh, was irate and angry about that when he found out afterwards. Rightly so, he said it caused him, it was going to cause him problems with the people of the land when they found out. But his sons couldn't have done any less in the face of the, the, the hurt and desecration of, of Dinah. And if indeed they had turned around and given Dinah as a wife uh, to Shechem, that would have been appeasing, and it would have been essentially selling their sister, uh, as they put it, as a whore. Uh, and I don't think that that would have encouraged better or more respectful behavior uh, on the part of uh, the other side. Jump something to think about, and it crossed my mind. There's a great analogy about it. Um, uh, one other thing was uh, uh, a word that I saw, and these are just my thoughts on the parasha since we have a few extra minutes. Uh, there was a word in the parasha, uh, chen. Uh, sometimes it means yes. Most often it means grace. Uh, and uh, when I say grace, I mean unmerited favor. Uh, unmerited favor. Uh, The word was used in the context of Yaakov's confrontation with his brother Esau. And he asked why, uh, Esau asked Yaakov why he was trying to give him all these uh, sheep and oxen, the gifts. Uh, And he said, because I sought to find grace in your sight. And he said it, or that was mentioned three times in the Torah portion. Uh, If you wonder what the word grace means, I mean, you know, a great, not only a definition, 
but an example of it. That's one. <clears throat> Yaakov had uh, essentially bought the birthright and stolen the blessing from his brother. And uh, then he ran away. And he knew that Asaph was thinking to kill him, planning to kill him. Uh, the problem uh, with all that for him was that he hadn't obtained those things in absolute righteousness uh, or according to the rules. He'd been deceptive. At that time, he was still the old heel catcher. He hadn't encountered the angel on the mount and become Yisrael, the righteous man, yet. And he had every reason to expect that he was running <laughs> from Levon right into uh, the clutches of Asav and that it might not go well with him. But where else did he have to go? And he knew Yahweh had given the promise of the land to him and his descendants, so he had to go. And so he had no right to ask any merited favor, uh, any kind of behavior from his brother Asav, and he sought grace because he'd not treated him right. He'd not treated Esau right. And he'd taken advantage of him and literally uh, stole the blessing. Unmerited favor, grace, chen in Hebrew. It's a great word to know. Uh, we still have extra time. So I'm just going to go on just a little bit. I'm going to read the Minhaz Akane commentary for this weekend. And uh, uh, just so you know, it's a commentary, uh, not a comprehensive one, just a short commentary on the Torah portion, uh, a thought from it that's supposed to inspire you and provoke you to think more deeply, um, study further. Uh, that's what it was done for. It was originally written for a prison congregation who wanted more in their week, more Torah study, more learning. Um, and so this is what their elder gave them. It says, Shalom Aleichem Akim, B'Shem Yahweh Elohei Yisrael. Peace to you, my brothers, in the name of Yahweh, the Mighty One of Yisrael. Vayomer lo Yaakov which translates, and he said, Thy name shall not be called Yaakov anymore, but Yisrael, for thou hast striven with Elohim and with men and hast prevailed. It's nowhere written that thou shalt have an easy life, full of vast material riches, free from all hardships, strife, and trials, although most of us would like it to be so, uh, such a life would defeat the very purpose of our being here on earth. Why are we here? The new name that Yaakov was given, Yisrael, which is the name by which we are also now called as a people under the commonwealth of Yisrael, or as one of the twelve tribes, <clears throat> has often been translated as the Prince of El. This is a fair translation, but the reason given to Yaakov in our passage for his name is that he'd striven with Elohim and with men. Uh, the word uh, Sarita, uh, from which the word Prince also is also deriv uh, derived, uh, connotes strength in the face of adversity, a powerful striving to succeed. Yaakov didn't have a life of ease, and it was certainly not free of hardship, strife, and trials, nor will ours be. If it were, we'd remain the same as we are, immature, childish, supplanters, heel catchers, full of deceit and guile. Yeah, that's us. It's only through our hardships and trials that we grow and can be molded into the princes that we are meant to be, ascending from the status of worms to that of men, as is written. <clears throat> Do not fear, you worm, Yaakov, and you men of Israel. I shall help you, declares Yahweh, your Redeemer. 
Oftentimes, real help from Yahweh can only come in the form of hardship and trials. Yaakov was far from a perfect man, and so it is with us. In this life, we will face setbacks and temporary failures, as did he. Yahweh knows this and understands. The lesson he teaches us in this parasha and the significance of the name Yisrael is that Yaakov never quit trying. He grasped the whole of Elohim himself and refused to ever let go. He indeed strove with Elohim and with men until he prevailed. Yehoshua HaMashiach, our Messiah and Master, said, He who endures to the end shall be saved. Yaakov Hatzadik, his half-brother, said, Blessed is the man who does endure trial, for when he has been proved, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Master's promised to those who love him. In all your lifetimes, in all of your strivings with both Elohim and with men, may you be one of those who never gives up, but instead endures and prevails. Don't quit. You can be that person. By the grace, mercy, and spirit of the mighty one of Israel, you too, through your trials and successes, and even through your failures, can become a prince of El. Yeah, even you. Bashalom. Yeah. That concludes the lesson for today. Uh, for the commandments and the Sabbath readings, for that matter. Uh, I hope you all learned and benefited once again. Uh, it, it is really my privilege to be able to bring this to you. 